morning and welcome to worship here at Bethel Lutheran Church in Winchester, Virginia. Good morning. I'm Pastor Dave Young, and I'm delighted that you are worshiping with us this morning. Please know that from wherever you are watching us, please know that all are welcome. And to help us best welcome you, we invite you to send us an email. Let us know that you are worshiping with us today. Let us know how we might be able to best minister with you. We now gather for our brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Let's take a few moments of silent reflection and confession with our God. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus opens the door for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome, and in Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us now live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world.
Let us pray. Righteous God, our merciful Master, you own the earth and all its peoples, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness. For that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Here ends our reading. Our gospel for today is from the 25th chapter of Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is as if a man going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. 
His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was mine own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of our Lord. Friends, grace to you and peace from God, who is our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, our Messiah. Amen. When I was a little kid, I would often be dragged along with my father to events at the church. He was a pastor as well, just like I am. And sometimes I wanted to go with him, sometimes I did not, not dissimilar to my own children. See, it's one of the realities of being a preacher's child. And while it can be annoying, for sure, being brought to all manner of church events, it does have its unique blessings. Being dragged to church events, which is something that I had to get used to as a kid, and truth be told, it really wasn't all that bad. Oftentimes, I would just play in my dad's office while he had a meeting or some other church activity. I think I even kept a stash of toys in his office for such occasions. You know, I remember being in my dad's office one evening, and it just so happened that I was pretty bored and ready to go, and he still wasn't done yet with what he needed to do. I had exhausted all the fun out of my toys, and I began looking for something to do in his office. I was just learning to read at that time, and I saw a funny-looking, colorful display that piqued my interest on one of his shelves. It looked kind of like a cartoon with a weird-looking guy and then some words, a caption. And I was trying to read the caption, but I could not quite make it all out. I knew that one word was God and that another word was no, but I couldn't figure out the rest. Well, finally, when my father got back in, I asked him, Daddy, what does this say? And he knelt beside me and asked me if I could read it. And I said, well, I know one word is God and that this word is no, but I don't know the other words. And then he told me what it said. It had this funny looking person on it. And then underneath it, it said, oh, the person had a smile on their face. They're funny looking with a smile on their face. And the words said, God don't make no junk. And I looked at my dad and I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, do you know what junk is? And I said, junk is that stuff that you don't want anymore. You throw it away. And he said, that's right. So what this is saying is God doesn't make anything that God does not want. God does not make anything that he wants to throw away. And I said, you mean like trees and animals and, and race cars? 
And he laughed. He said, yeah, all those things, but what else has God made? And I said, well, the sky, the sun, the moon. And then he said, yes, and who made you? And I said, God made me. He said, yes, God made you too. God makes everyone. So what do you think this means? And I said, God don't think I'm junk. God doesn't want to throw me away. And he said, son, that's exactly what this means. God will never throw you away. Because God don't make no junk. I don't know exactly why I remember this exchange from when I was around five or six years old. I'm sure I've embellished it in my mind over the years. But indeed, that experience has stuck with me. God don't make no junk. God will not ever throw me away. Is there a better way to explain to a five-year-old or a 45-year-old or a 95-year-old for that matter this incredible truth about our relationship with our loving God? Jesus, I believe, is getting at this same point when he shares a admittedly complicated, if not controversial, parable with us today, the parable of the talents. Now Jesus tells this parable about three servants who are given various amounts of talents. Now talent was a large sum of money, equivalent actually to two years worth of salary. In fact, the word that we now understand as talent, that we use to describe someone's ability uh, to do something, it's actually come to us from this very parable. Now the master asked the three servants to use their talents. And two of the three do so. And we are told that they are called good and faithful and trustworthy. But then there is that third servant. And we are told that this servant does not Use the talent given to him because he is afraid. And this causes the ire of the master. And it is this response of the third servant, not acting and using their talent because of misplaced fear, that serves, in my estimation, as the core teaching for us today. You know, one of the tremendous blessings of being a pastor is the opportunity to experience the breadth of giftedness in a congregation. It has been a beautiful experience for me to witness the many and varied talents that the congregations I've served, from my internship congregation, St. John's Lutheran Church in Springfield, Ohio, to my first call at Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, to now here, my call at Bethel, Winchester. It's been a beautiful experience to witness the many and varied talents that the people in all of those places have possessed. I just finished up the 200th anniversary video uh, this week, and I hope that you've had a chance to watch it either on our website or on our YouTube channel. And as I was making it, it was yet another reminder to me of the amazing gifts and talents that are on display here at Bethel and have been on display here at Bethel over our many years as a congregation. From the shrimp boil, to mission trips to Africa, to the hoedown, to Lutheran camps with our kids, to Bible studies and returning thanks, and many, many different service opportunities with CCAP and all over this uh, county and this state, this nation, indeed the world. Uh, this place, Bethel, has and continues to be a ministry of tremendous blessing and giftedness. When I was on internship at St. John's Lutheran Church in Springfield, Ohio, we started a ministry called the Free University. 
And the genesis behind this ministry was my senior pastor, Alan Dietz, who caught this vision. You see, after building relationships with the people at St. John's, and then, sadly, after performing some of their funerals, it dawned on him that these people and their giftedness were no longer accessible to the congregation, indeed, to the world, indeed, within the kingdom of God. And it, and it saddened him because the people were uniquely talented. One knew almost everything you would ever want to know about cars. Another was a fantastic potter. Another made quilts. Another had traveled around the world and spoke several different languages. The point, he told me, was that in every congregation, no matter how large or how small, there exists at this same breadth of unique, God-given talent. And so the free university that we offered allowed people to offer their gifts free of charge to the greater community for learning, for growth, and for sharing. We eventually had classes on flower arranging, golfing, biblical studies, poetry, car maintenance, CPR, healthy eating, yoga, book clubs, and the list goes on and on. All led by parishioners who offered their time and talent for the ongoing enhancement of the community. To be sure, I have often thought of doing the same thing here at Bethel, because in getting to know you over the past 10 years, I am reminded again and again of your bounty of giftedness and talent. God has indeed been very good to us at Bethel. Still, as our text reminds us, and if we are honest in admitting to ourselves, we are often susceptible, are we not? to hiding our talent too. Because of fear, perhaps, either fear that we are not talented enough or fear that we are not relevant enough, we can often forget that God has given all of us giftedness and talent and has done so for a purpose. God does not want us to bury our talents, but to embrace them, to use them, to share them for God's sake. And our parable today suggests that God does not care if we try and fail. God would rather us try and fail. God would rather us risk ourselves in faith and fail rather than not even try. So what talent might God be calling you to offer right now? Where might God be asking you to offer yourself to those in need right now? Who might God be calling you to offer your talent to right now? The truth is, if we are not regularly asking these questions of ourselves, and to be honest with one another, well, friends, we need to be doing so. I listened to a podcast once where the commentator said something quite uh, provocative. She said, to enact God's purposes in this world, God needs a body. Let me say that again. To enact God's purposes in this world, God needs a body. And she went on to say that God needs this body. The body of Christ. To risk ourselves, our talent, our giftedness, as, as we become the active embodiment of God's purpose and will for the world in our lives. God needs a body. God needs some body. God needs you. God needs us. God has uniquely gifted you. God has uniquely gifted us to be the visible expression of God's grace, love, and mercy in this world. Now, to be sure, God does not need us. 
because God is somehow unable or insufficient. No, God has done God's job by giving this world everyone and everything it needs to live in accordance with God's purpose and promise. As wise people before me have said multiple times concerning hunger in our world, God has provided all the food that we need for everyone to be fed. The issue is not God's provision, but fair distribution of food around our world. No, God does not need us to be fully God. But the world God loves so much does need you and me so that to live faithfully so that we might be blessings in this world the God, the world that God loves needs you to risk your talent your faith and your heart the world that God loves needs you and me to trust God and not be afraid Throughout scripture, those words, do not be afraid, are on the lips of the faith. They're on the lips of the Lord talking to the people of faith in the Hebrew scriptures. It's on the words of Jesus to his disciples. Do not be afraid for God has freed us. And God seeks to free us from our fear. He has freed us so that we might Move beyond our fear and risk and share and even fail in his name. God has freed us from listening to those voices that tell us that we are unworthy. God has freed us from succumbing to those words that declare that we are not relevant. God has freed us from buying into our consumer culture that seeks to enslave us. God has freed us. From thinking that any politician or any political party is our savior. God has freed us from believing that might makes right. And God has freed us from accepting that some in God's creation, because they are different, are not worthy of his love. God has freed us to see beyond the divisions our world sets up and recognize the humanity in every soul. And God has made us free. Why? Because God has destined us for this freedom so that we might use the talents for the kingdom in this world. God needs us to be faithful. God needs you to be faithful. God needs a body. And before you begin to think for whatever reason that you cannot be somebody, remember, God don't make no junk. In Jesus' name. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of the church, ignite your people with the passion of your love. 
By the fire of your Holy Spirit, unify us across ministries, congregations, and denominations, and refine us to participate in your activity throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of creation, we stand in awe at the works of your hands and praise you for the beauty of nature. Bless the earth for your glory and restore its integrity where exploitation has caused ruin. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the nations, sound forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Increase concern for those who are most vulnerable, especially as international leaders forge trade agreements and cooperate to end human rights abuses. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic illness, unemployment, and loneliness with your radiant light. Send us as encouragement and signs of your healing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the stranger, stir up holy restlessness in us to extend love to those at the margins. Release our desire for control and open us to learn from the perspectives of others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of the living and the dead, we give you thanks for all the saints at rest from their labors. Rouse us to live by their example that saints yet to come may also know your love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. We thank you for your continued support of our ministry at Bethel. We could not do what we do without your help during this time of COVID-19, so we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity and your love. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Friends, the body of Christ given for you. Friends, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. And may Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. 